Hello and welcome to GameSack. This time we're talking about some games that we've never been able to beat. No, and these are games we've tried many, many times to beat and we have not been able to do it, but hey, here we are again. Let's <laughs> see what happens, huh? Yeah, exactly. Let's just get right on into it. Ninja Gaiden on the NES is one of those games that has caused me lots of pain back in the day. I must be a masochist because I keep coming back for more. Every time I play this game I start thinking that I've got it down and I've got all the patterns. I beat a few levels and get a bit cocky and then I reach level 5-3 and that's where everything just falls apart. I can't beat this freaking stage! It's not my fault though. I mean look at this, do you think you could make it past this with no problems? You've got some ridiculous platforming to do and it doesn't help that they put an enemy right in the middle of the platform either. He's a pain in the ass with his three shot burst from his gun. Not only that, but you're right at the spawn point of another character that comes bouncing in from the side. The best you can do is try to time the shots from the guy with the gun to the unlimited enemies coming from the side. If you're lucky, you'll get past the first one by using the fire wheel to just plow through the first platform. Then there's another one right after that and by this time your fire wheel has run out so it's just you and mass confusion, so good luck! You'd think that I'd just forget about this game and move on, and I usually do. A week will go by, or a couple of months. Even a few years have gone by, but I keep coming back thinking that this will be the time and I will kill Jokuyo or the Demon King, but no, I fail again. I keep coming back to this title because it's a solid game. There's no doubt about it that it was programmed well. Controlling Ryu is easy. He's fast and nimble, and if I had one wish it would be that he could swing his sword while he's clinging to a wall. Plus he looks really cool when he runs, cause he's got that sweet ninja style. I like how the levels are all set up with lots of platforming and I like that you can break things to get power-ups. Breaking lanterns is believable because people could easily hide stuff inside of them. But when you get to an outside level and have to kill hovering birds to gain items, that, that becomes a bit unbelievable. What do they do? Train the birds to hover in one spot holding an item waiting to be killed? It'd be more believable if they tied the bird to the ground so they couldn't fly away. Enough of that though, as you can see the action in this game is non-stop. The enemies respawn infinitely if you don't keep moving. There's a lot of instances that you'll get surrounded by enemies, and if you do, just plow through them and keep moving forward. A lot of times the enemies will just disappear if you can get them off the screen. The good thing is that everything throughout the stage takes one hit to kill. This makes it very easy to time a single sword swipe or a throwing star and keep moving. The levels start out short and get longer as you progress through the game. You'll run into boss fights at the end of each area, and these really aren't that difficult. Each one has an easy pattern to it, and it won't take long for you to figure it out. This is cool because it makes the boss fights much more fun. Between each scene and area is a cutscene that pieces the story together. I've always loved these and they look amazing. This is one of the first games that I played that had a cutscene after every area and back in the day, believe me, this was a really big deal. I almost felt like I was watching a movie at times. And to top it all off, you've got a great soundtrack that really is a big part of the game. There's a lot of very memorable tunes and easily one of the most memorable is when you die. You'll hear this jingle a lot because you'll be dying a lot. You do have infinite continues and all you have to do is press start at the game over screen. It's weird because there's nothing prompting you to continue so you might be sitting there wondering what's going on. Is the game really over? It's only over when you decide it's over. Or beat it. I'm guessing that you'll decide it's over before you beat it, but what do I know? This is a true classic for the NES and there's no way I'm done challenging the game. It's beaten me every time, but one day I'll be the one to gloat. Alright, let's try Alex Kidd and Shinobi World on the Sega Master System again. Back when we did the episode about Act Razor and Alex Kidd, I had to borrow Dave's copy. But now I finally have my own. The game only has four rounds with two levels each plus a boss fight, so I really should be able to beat it, but I haven't. Granted, I really don't play games with the purpose of beating them. I play them to have fun, and if I keep dying a lot, I just turn them off and go do something else. But I feel with this game being so damn short, there can't be any excuse for this. Anyway, first off, I've got to say that this is by far and away the best game that Alex Kidd has ever been playable in. I mean, the other Alex Kidd games were alright, but wedging a great deal of Shinobi in here really helps improve things. In fact, this game wasn't even originally going to have Alex Kidd in there. It was just going to be a cute version of Shinobi called Shinobi Kid, kind of like how Parodius is a cute version of Gradius. 
The first boss in the game who throws fireballs and shrinks after he's been damaged was originally a parody of Mario. Could Shinobi Kid have been inspired by this unfinished minigame found in the prototype Revenge of Shinobi ROM that came out earlier? Who knows? For whatever reason, they decided to change the main character to Alex Kidd, and here he is, starring in his final game ever. They also changed the name and the appearance of the first boss, but his attacks still remain the same. The story of the game has your girlfriend kidnapped by the Dark Ninja. Since she's now his hostage, this somehow enables him to take over the entire world. But the spirit of another ninja invades your body so you can put a stop to all this craziness. I'm not sure if Alex gave consent to that or not. This is a simple yet really good game. Your main form of attack is your sword, which doesn't have a great deal of range. You can upgrade this so that it attacks at a wider range all around you, but those upgrades are very few and far between. You can also get a spear which you can throw. You can jump and bounce off of walls as well as spin around poles and shoot yourself off like a fireball, which is pretty cool. There's even ninja magic that you can use every once in a while. The control is slightly slippery and your hitbox is pretty big, and these things take a little while to get used to. I'm not hugely fond of when platformers have their characters ramp up their speed and down when they start and stop. I don't know, I just don't want realistic momentum in my platformers, I guess. The game also has multiple paths which you can take through round 3 or round 4, which is pretty cool. You can take multiple hits, but if you're not careful, you can be killed pretty quickly. The game isn't quite as easy as you might think. That said, it's not overly difficult either. So why the hell can't I beat it? Well, because in the upper levels, it's really, really easy to get hit, and despite the general abundance of hearts, it's really easy to lose all of your life and die. What's worse is that there's only one continue. Why only one? Better than none, I suppose, but it seems like such an odd number to have. The last level pits you against the Mario doppelganger again, but this time you don't have the spear and it's hard to hit him at close range without getting hit yourself. This right here is the part that keeps getting me. Damn this part! I've played through the game several times now, and I can't make it very far into round 4. Maybe I need to play on a CRT, but I can't do that and capture footage at the same time. The graphics are fairly decent for the system, and there's a fair amount of color. The character sprites are really nothing special though, and they don't need to be. The music is pretty good, at least it is when it's giving nods to Shinobi. The original music is kind of ho-hum. It doesn't support FM sound, unfortunately, since it wasn't released in Japan. Oh well, I still can't beat this one right now, and I'll be damned if I keep trying because I've got other games I need to play for this episode. I honestly don't feel too bad about it. It's a good game that's fun to play, and I recommend it even though the price is going up, but I don't think that beating it or not beating it is something I'm too bothered with anymore. Earthworm Jim 2 was released in 1995 for the PC and various consoles. I'm playing the Super Nintendo version here since that was the version I played back when it was released. I've always liked Earthworm Jim as a character and I even watched the animated cartoon when I could catch it. It's just a completely different idea for a hero. Set in a totally wacky world, a spacesuit falls on Jim the Earthworm and he gains all the powers of a human and more. Anyways, here in part 2, Jim is setting out once again to rescue Princess What's Her Name before she's forced to marry Psycho. Jim has many more weapons at his disposal this time around, and most of them are really great except the bubble gun, which is just a joke. I still like using Jim's basic blasters, it's really all that's needed for this game. Not only that, but Jim is traveling with his green loogie Snot on his back. Snot can cling to anything that's dripping in green, and this helps Jim get across some wide gaps. This game is loaded with crazy levels that are mostly really fun to play. Levels like Puppy Love. Here is Psycho as Dognap, Peter Puppy's 600 puppies. He's throwing them out the window to kill them for some reason. All you have is a marshmallow to bounce the puppies across the courtyard to get back to Peter. It started out easy, but by the third round it's really tough. If you let four of Peter's puppies die, then he gets kind of upset and takes it out on you. You can't escape the wrath of Psycho Peter, so just sit there and take it. The line scrolling looks really nice, and the level is set to the Italian Tarantella, which is perfect music for some reason. Another strange but fun level is the Villi people. In this one, Jim is a blind cave salamander for some reason, and he must navigate a maze not touching anything but power-ups and collectibles. Touching the walls takes life, and it's fairly difficult when the level is littered with pinball bumpers. Again, this level has some great music in the form of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, and it all ends with a quiz show that asks completely senseless multiple-choice questions. The game also has lots of regular run-and-gun style levels like Lorenzo's Soil here. Jim must blast his way to the topsoil. Your gun has unlimited ammo, and when you shoot the dirt it falls and will build up platforms for you to reach higher areas. 
The whole thing is timed, but it's not a problem since there's plenty of pocket watches around that will start your timer over again. This level has some really good music as well that sounds like Enya or Enigma or one of those. Rosie. Then there's levels here that I'm not really fond of like The Flying King. Here Jim takes his pocket rocket and the level plays kind of like an isometric shooter. The goal here is to bump this bomb to the end of the level and blow up the big green thing at the end. It's really tough with all the crap that's flung at you as you're trying to bounce this bomb along. Then you hit random speed rockets which propel you way forward or backwards and then you have to find that damn balloon again. Then of course there's the level that I still can't get past. No matter how many times I play this game I cannot get past ISO 9000. There's stacks of paper all around and Jim can't get any traction on them. It has these stupid filing cabinets that have no discernible pattern but you have to jump on the open drawer to get past them. It's pure misery as you're constantly losing life going through this level. I make it to a certain area every time where I need to use this cabinet to get to an upper platform on the right. When his drawer opens, Jim can't get traction in all the newspapers to run and jump on it until it's too late and the drawer closes. By then the cabinet gets pissed off and attacks Jim. There's been many times when I've had 70% life and I die immediately from this stupid thing. I drain all my continues and then it's game over and there's no way in hell I'm going to start from the beginning again. So the game just sits here for months or maybe years until I get the hanker into play again. I do have a lot of fun playing this game and Tommy Tallarico did a great job with the soundtracks even though it's not all original. But I fear I'll never beat it unless I can figure out the patterns of those stupid filing cabinets. All right, Dave, uh, we're 0 for 3 right now. Yeah, so. not looking very pretty, is it? No, it's mm, not. But you know what? It's, it's still fun. I'm still having a good time. Yeah. Uh, you know, but hang in there. Who knows what's going to happen in this last half of the show? Let's find out. Ah, Lord of the Sword on the Sega Master System. This one came out back when Sega really started pushing more complex adventure games on their platform. It plays like a hack and slash, but there's really a lot more to it than that. Basically, there's some form of evil and the king is dead and you want to be the new king. But in order to do that, you need to pass three tests. All right, I love tests. Now, if you were like I was when I originally rented this, you won't know what the hell is going on with this game. You can swing your sword for a close range attack, fire off an unlimited amount of arrows, and jump by pressing up. So you do this, attacking enemies and go from stage to stage, and nothing really ever happens. Well, you die, that'll definitely happen. Lots of stages have multiple paths that you can take, and the way the stages are all stitched together is really confusing, especially when most of them look like all the other stages in the game. Sure, you can pause the game and get a map, but it doesn't show you where you are or even the names of any of the places. It doesn't even give you a starting point, it's completely useless. Even the arrow signs in the stages don't tell you what is where. You really need to have the manual which has a much better map in it. It's not great, but you can kind of make out which way you need to go most of the time. Well, that is if you know the name of the place that you need to get to. When you talk to the people in the towns, they often don't give you much to go on at all. So what usually ends up happening is that you just die again and again and you hope that something happens and nothing ever does. Well, it turns out that you need to do things in a certain order so everything else opens up. First, you visit the wizard and he gives you a book. But you need to be careful because these stupid bastards keep trying to steal the book. You really need to keep it, otherwise you're screwed. If you talk to certain people a certain number of times, secret paths will open up that weren't there before. Most of these things you would never think of. Still, this time I pressed on and actually got much further than I ever have before. I actually made it to a boss fight. This is pretty cool, though when you defeat the boss he just disappears and that's it. I guess I'm just so used to status screens or some other kind of fanfare when I defeat a boss. You're not gonna get that here. After I beat this one, I got a leaf in my inventory. Yay. The next boss I fought was a bit more challenging as I had to deal with his lackeys while simultaneously trying to shoot his mirror when he exposed it. I died a few times fighting this one. Fortunately, the game lets you continue and it starts you off at the beginning of the stage where you died with all of your progress intact. Unless you die fighting a boss, then you start on the stage before the boss. And sadly, you only get one life per continue. So after a long while, all was going pretty well in my game. In fact, I had passed the first of the three tests. 
I even made it to the third boss. Look at these amazing graphics. Yes, it's Lord of the Sword on the Sega Master System. Once again, I died, but this time the title screen defaulted to start instead of continue. All my progress was lost and I spent so much damn time getting there. Well, it turns out that you only have 10 continues, thus only 10 lives. Damn, if it took me 10 continues just to make it a third of the way in the game, I doubt I could beat it without cheating or really, really practicing for a long time. I like the graphics and there's some cool parallax scrolling in here. And I really like the music as well. Still, I don't really recommend this one, but it's one that I would have loved to see the ending to just because I like adventure games. Here's Legendary Wings for the NES. It's a vertical shooter by Capcom USA. I remember my brother-in-law having this game back in 1988. I'd play it on occasion but never really thought much about it. I'd watch him play and he wouldn't get very far and then we'd play multiplayer and would have the same results. We'd get two, maybe three levels into it and just die or give up and play something else. As time went by I eventually got my own copy of the game. I'd play it every once in a while but nothing serious. Again I'd maybe get three levels into it and put it down. I don't know exactly why I never got the urge to try and beat the game, but it just never happened. Well, here I am today sitting down again to play this game and see if I can finally finish it. It's really cool to boot this up again after so many years. I'm immediately thrown back into nostalgia mode by the music. I've got to say that the soundtrack is pretty good. It really has that 8-bit Capcom feel to it. I sense a lot of similarities to other Capcom games, especially Mega Man. If you listen to it for a little bit, you'll probably feel the same way too. This one is mainly played as a vertical shooter. You have a weapon that can be upgraded four times by collecting power-up icons. These appear at certain points during a stage. Powering up your weapons does more than just that. It also lets you take extra hits. When you get hit by an enemy bullet, your weapon will lose one level of its strength. And once you get powered up all the way, you become a badass phoenix looking thing. In this form, you can take a few extra hits before you go back down a level. You can also drop bombs on ground targets. There's three areas to each stage that play as a horizontal shooter. Halfway through each stage is a huge face that looks like it's blowing its breath at you. If this breath touches you, you get sucked inside its face. This is a bad thing. Typically it's not difficult, but it's bad because you have to fight your way out of this thing. When you're inside, it looks like you're inside its intestines or something. I don't think this is the case since there's these toothy mouths and hearts in the background. After you blast your way out of this thing, you go back out right to where you went in. The second area is different in each stage. When you blow up a random mine on the ground, you get sucked into a bonus level. These are also side-scrolling, but there's nothing to kill here. All you have to do is collect all the icons for points, extra continues, and weapon power-ups. The bonus areas have an Egyptian feel to them. There's lots of hieroglyphs and pharaohs in the background, and even the icons you pick up are Egyptian. These areas are great because you'll get tons of points, and usually you'll earn at least one extra life. After this, you'll return to the overhead portion until you fight the mid-boss, which is a dragon. After defeating him, you go into the side-scrolling mode again and fight your way to the devil. These boss fights are super easy if you're powered up. Even if you aren't powered up, they're not bad, but they'll take a lot longer with your puny weapon. I always did like the graphics in this game. Firstly, I like the idea of your winged protagonist. Yeah, he's a decent-sized sprite, meaning that it's a lot harder to dodge enemy bullets, but he looks pretty cool. The backgrounds are great, and most of the overhead levels have a Greek mythology feel to them with lots of columns and temples. The only real bad thing about this game is that the mid-boss and level bosses are all the same. You know what to expect and you fight them the exact same way every time. The level bosses do get slightly tougher as they shoot more eyeballs at you, but they become very predictable and you can almost beat them with your eyes closed. Almost. There's only five stages to this game and if you're powered up throughout, you won't have any problems beating it. As I said before, I'm not exactly sure why I never beat this game back in the day, but it wasn't due to difficulty. I think I must have just been bored at the time of having to fight the same enemies and bosses over and over. Still, I set my mind to it and I actually did beat it, so I can scratch this off my list. I've got to say that beating it for this episode was enjoyable. Will I go back and beat it again in the future? Who knows, but I like to think that I will. Even though it's short and repetitive, I would still give this game a good score as it's definitely worth your time. Legendary Axe on the TurboGrafx-16 is one I've never been able to get far in at all. 
This is a side-scrolling hack-and-slash game that some people compare to Rastan, but it's actually quite different. Despite never being able to get very far, I've always really enjoyed playing this one. There's just something about the way it feels when you're controlling it that's very satisfying. It has some great platforming. Anyway, you've got an axe, which is legendary. The legends prophesied that it could be powered up with two different icons. The first legend tells of one that extends the bar at the top of the screen. This bar goes away each time you swing the axe and then starts to refill automatically. The more full the bar is when you swing, the more powerful your attack is, according to the legend. The second legend speaks of the shield-looking icon which will let you swing your axe faster and also increases the speed at which the power bar recovers. There's other not-so-legendary stuff that you can get like orbs to refill your life bar and jewels for points. You'll also encounter the occasional 1-up. So this is all well and good, but when you die, one level of your power gets taken away. But it's usually not very hard to get powered back up just as long as you don't die close to where you respawn. Also, when you get hit, you bounce back and that can lead to your demise in many situations, so you need to be really careful. I usually die in stage 3B by falling off of these platforms in the water. It's very easy to just keep jumping forward and then get hit by one of these green guys that pop up. That will of course cause you to bounce back and fall into the abyss. If that doesn't get me, then the boss will because they trap you and you can't get up. Well, this time I made it through the platforming parts just fine and I didn't have a single issue at all. I did die a couple of times at the boss, but eventually I got it. Stage 4A is just a quick and dirty boss fight if you can call it that, and it's really hard to lose. I've been to stage 4B before, but only once in my entire life. This one's really tough if you don't have the enemy patterns memorized. There's tons of these bouncy guys which take no less than 14,231 hits to kill. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself fighting more than one of them at a time plus other enemies. You gotta take it slow or it's gonna get really annoying really fast. Another thing you need to worry about pretty much the entire game are the bats and butterflies above you. I think they're butterflies. Anyway, if you jump, you can hit them and that'll damage you and of course make you bounce back and who knows where the hell you're gonna land. They're here on stage 4B as well during the platforming part, so watch out. Oh, look at this guy. I know he's gonna take at least two hits to kill. I'll jump, hit him once, and then jump back. Crap! What the hell? I guess that doesn't work. But doing it this way does. Can't stand up yet or I'm dead. So I finally get past stage 4B. Here I am in stage 4C and I've never been here before in my life. Seems pretty easy so far. Ah, crap, hidden holes. There's a joke there and I'm not going there. Oh well, this spider is easy enough to beat. I've never been fully powered up before. Wow, that does a ton of damage. I like it. But there are hidden holes all over the place in the stage. These monkeys will kill you almost instantly and it's really hard to shake them off and escape. Damn it. I gotta say, it's been a while since I've ever been this frustrated at a game. Damn monkeys! This makes me want to go to the zoo and kill real monkeys! Sad to say, I couldn't make it past these damn rooms even when I tried to skip them. The monkeys did me in and I was never able to make it past stage 4C. There's six stages total and the last stage consists of only the final boss, so I did okay, I think. I really do recommend this game though. The graphics are good for an early game and the music is really enjoyable as well. It's tons of fun to play. But again, I never play this game with the intention of actually beating it, except for today. Update! I tried it again and I was actually able to skip over the monkey pits and I made it to the boss. And I beat their asses and I made it to zone 5. And this one is a bitch. You'll die a lot and I was powered all the way down. That makes fighting this guy take about, I don't know, 20 minutes. Honestly, it's best just to skip him and power yourself back up. These axe guys will also do a number on you, so I hope you like bouncing backwards into the pits. I love bouncing backwards when I get hit. Love it, love it, love it! And it seems that if you die anywhere in the stage, you're gonna start over from the beginning. I just turned it off at this point. I'd had enough. Will I play it again? Damn straight I will. Will I beat it? I doubt it, but maybe I will. Either way, it's fine, because I enjoy it. It's awesome. Get it. Boy, you really do suck at these games, Joe. <laughs> I mean, man, you were horrible. Oh, come on, man. You couldn't even beat Ninja Gaiden. What the hell is wrong with you? Everyone can beat that. <laughs> Everybody can. Yeah. Well, at least I beat one of the games that I was trying to beat, and, you know, I feel good about that. Yeah. And, 
at least we've been able to get a little bit further in some of these games too than we have in the past also. Yeah, Legendary Axe is truly an awesome game. Mm -hmm. uh, it gets crazy hard in that uh, second to last zone, but yeah. Hey, we're not giving up and, you know. Yeah, I'm definitely playing that one again because yeah. that's an awesome game. For sure. It's always been an awesome game. Always. Anyway, what are some games that you guys have never been able to beat and were you able to beat them like when you came back like years and years later like we were trying to do? Uh, let us know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching Game Sack. No, 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 no! Don't do that! Don't die! Oh, God! I hate these freaking hurt games! I can't play them anymore! I hate them! God damn it! Dave, what the hell is wrong with you? I'm sick of these hard games, Joe! I can't beat them! I can't beat these hard games! I hate them! I'm not gonna play them anymore! Well, at least you can still beat your meat. Oh, yeah, that's true. I can do that. Ooh, yeah, I think I'll just leave now. <laughs>